please welcome David McConville. <laughs> Thanks, <Paul. laughs> So um, we've been hearing a lot about practical strategies today. And so I just wanted to spend a few minutes to really think about the big picture context of what's going on, that we've been hearing about big data, about analytics. But I'd really like to consider how big data visualization can actually help us to think more systemically about what's really happening. So the term paradigm shift, we hear it all the time in business, but it was actually coined in 1962 by Thomas Kuhn. This was the same year that Rachel Carson came out with her, her famous book, Silent Spring. And this was describing the shift from an Earth-centered to a Sun-centered model around 500 years ago that really catalyzed the scientific revolution. This is extremely relevant for what's going on right now because this eventually gave rise to this paradigm where we believe the universe is kind of this predictable machine, that the Earth is just a resource. It's like everywhere else, something to be exploited. But in the 1960s, this really started to pretty radically change. That this quest for a transcendent God's eye view was actually made possible because of the space age. And it really started to radically shift perspectives on the nature of our home planet. That as images started to come back from satellites and astronauts, that they started to be distributed all over the world. And these whole Earth images really started to catalyze this incredible imagination of the human species. We started to realize that these political constructs that we put, these political boundaries, really are an illusion. And many hoped that this would help people to understand that this is one interconnected planetary system. And as many of you in the room are well aware, I'm sure, these images had a, a pretty profound impact on the founding of the environmental movement. They're often credited and deeply associated with Earth Day and everything else. But today, we really take these images for granted. We don't think about them much. They're usually good sometimes for finding our rooftops, for maybe navigating our cities. So it's not so profound anymore. Because for a lot of us in the room, these images were coming back actually before we were born. So we've lived in this world where we've always had these whole Earth views. Back in the 1920s, Buckminster Fuller started to imagine ways in which we could use these types of visualizations, this kind of data, for really making sense of what it means to be a planetary civilization. And for decades, he kept track before this era of big data. He was keeping track of global trends. He was looking at the material usages, the efficiency that he called the accelerating acceleration of efficiency of doing more with less, of energy consumption, of the power to consume. And today, this was right at the cusp of what today we think of as the great acceleration, these, these really ubiquitous hockey stick curves that we find all over the place. And he was trying to understand how it is we could make these curves sensible and help people to understand what's going on at a planetary scale. He actually proposed these global visualization displays to put outside of the UN and all around the world so that decision makers, community leaders, and general citizens could really start to understand that we're all implicated in this together, that it's everybody or nobody. And he took all of this data, he cl collected this in the mid-1960s in what he called the inventory of world resources, human trends, and needs. And the idea with this was to play what he called the world game, which was a, a challenge to the players to design a world that would work for 100% of huna humanity in what he called the shortest possible time without ecological offense or disadvantage to anyone. And today, we actually have this capacity. At the time, it was probably 50 years ahead of what was technically feasible. And so today, we've got all these satellites that are encircling the Earth, giving us these incredible, dynamic, and intimate views of our cosmic home. And for the past few years, I've been experimenting with what it means to use these big data visualization tools with science centers around the US. I've been working with scientists, artists, designers to really engage communities in dialogues about not only the present, but also the past and the future of how we're thinking about the trajectory of our human civilization. That it's not just climate change, and oftentimes you say climate change, everything becomes reduced to CO2, but there are all of these other planetary boundaries that have been quantified, dealing with ocean acidification, land use, water. So we're all familiar that all of these are in within these larger systems, but when you're engaging communities in dialogues, it's very important to understand the ways in which they relate to people locally on the ground. And one of the most important things we can be doing is to help, help people to actually see 
the dynamism of this planet to really fall in love with what's going on here because there are so many processes that are invisible to us most of the time, but we can extend our perceptions to understand what's going on with the oceans, with the atmospheres, with the land. We can begin to understand how warm air goes up to the poles, cold air goes down to the equator to equalize all of the planetary climate, and that we take these things for granted because for the most part, we don't experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. We can also visualize things like migrations of animals. This is a storks that are wintering in Africa. They fly up to Europe to, to have their beautiful springs so that they can start to reproduce. We can also visualize the migration patterns of human beings. This is a visualization of shipping lanes, of cables, of cities. We can start to get a much better sense of the effect that human civilization is having on the planetary system. And of course, we're familiar with what's happening with greenhouse gases, not only CO2, but also black carbon. When we're burning coal, we're burning different types of diesel. And we can study the effects that these are having by actually using satellite imagery and doing time lapse to make the invisible visible, to bring all of this within our sensory perception. Here we're seeing the sea ice extent that's rapidly changing over the course of this, this accelerated imagery. But if we zoom out just a little bit more, we can start to understand that there are many other conditions, even within our cosmic ecosystem, that have made life possible here. That our Earth has this magnetic field because it cooled down fast enough over the course of its evolution that this field is protecting us from this constant bombardment of protons from the solar winds of the sun. And we zoom out even further and we start to understand that we are in this perfect spot within our solar system called the habitable zone or sometimes called the Goldilocks zone. It's the only place in our solar system that liquid water exists on the surface of a planet. It's not too hot, it's not too cold, and this is what astronomers are looking for in all of these other solar systems to try to find other planets that might have life on them. But even that old Copernican view of the static sun is outdated by centuries now. We now know that we are on board a watery living spaceship traveling around the sun at 60,000 miles an hour, which is also traveling around the galactic core at about half a million miles an hour. So our fundamental mental models of this place that we are are extraordinarily outdated most of the time. And this is probably nowhere more spectacularly visualized and demonstrated than in NASA's Digital Universe Atlas. Now this is a video that was created at the American Museum of Natural History at the Hayden Planetarium that you can see on YouTube. This is sped up for the, for the sake of speed. But as we start to pull out, we can see all of the satellites orbiting the planet that we're using for observing our systems and communicating. We can see the moon's orbit, the orbit of the other planets. As we pull out to a light hour, we start to see the totality of our solar system. A light day, you see the constellations come into view. We shift perspectives on our constellations, and you see their true relationships. You see the radio footprint of humanity in space, our own galaxy of hundreds of billions of stars. All of these other dots represent other galaxies with hundreds of billions of stars. We've got these big blind spots of stuff we can't see out to the very edge of what's called the cosmic microwave background or our cosmic horizon, what we can't see beyond. Got that? OK, <laughs> 10 minutes, man. Um, <laughs> so. What's amazing about this is that like the biggest news of a generation you probably haven't heard, and that's within this new cosmic model funded by NASA, Earth is once again at the center. <laughs> Pretty weird, right? <laughs> now, this is because of the relativistic speed of light. Astronomers call it our observational center. But I'd like to propose that it's actually because it's our ecological center. Earth is still the only place we've found that supports life. This is actually going against centuries of assumptions that we would find life everywhere else. But today, because we've been taking these conditions for granted for so long, that these outdated paradigms of short-term thinking, of, of infinite growth, of assuming that the Earth is just a resource to be exploited, is really threatening the only home that we have in the universe, that we've discovered that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the biosphere. It's not the other way around. So that, 
the true paradigm shift of the space age is that we are all indigenous earthlings. And it's up to every one of us to design a regenerative planet planetary civilization that isn't deteriorating the conditions for life on our planet, but actually enlivening this world that we're in. Thanks. <laughs>